So next we're talking about the state of the California supply chain from cultivation, lab testing, manufacturing, distribution, and retail. Uh, we have a set of super talented operators here who are going to converse on the state of the supply chain. Uh, first up, I'm happy to introduce Crystal Ortiz, the founder of High Water Farm. Crystal Ortiz is a permaculture gardener and she's located in the Emerald Triangle. She's also on the board of the International Cannabis Farmers Association, which is a group of stakeholders and scientists committed to traditional sun-grown farming practices. Crystal also owns Herb and Market Humboldt, a dispensary in Arcata that offers curated products and connects the farmer and the consumer with each other. Welcome, Crystal. Next, we have Zachary Eisenberg, the Vice President and COO of Onresco Labs. Zach is the third generation of Eisenbergs to manage Onresco's operations. After receiving his MBA from the Ross School of Business in 2015, he spearheaded efforts to expand Onresco's scope of activity into cannabis and hemp testing. Zach is the co-chair of the American Council of Independent Laboratories Cannabis Working Group and a member of the ASTM subcommittee developing shelf life, shelf life stability standards for cannabis products. Welcome, Zach. Next, we have Brian Dewey, the VP of sales from Kiva Confections, um, where he, which is a full service sales and distribution company um, and an industry leading supplier. Uh, Brian has more than 20 years of sales and distribution experience in cannabis and craft beer and is a proven leader with experience building sales and logistics teams, key account strategy, developing brand strategy and development, and he is an elected board member of the Cannabis Distribution Association. Welcome, Brian. Next, we have Boris Sharansky. Please correct me if I've totally butchered your last name, who is the chief operating officer for Papa and Barkley. Um, he co-founded Papa and Barkley in 2016 and heads cannabis sourcing, production, and distribution for Papa and, Barkley's, Papa and Barkley's relief line of wellness products and Papa's selects, select living extracts. Boris is also a founding member of the California Hemp Council and previously served on the board of the California Cannabis Distribution Association. Welcome, Boris. Next, we have David Hua, the CEO and co-founder of Meadow, a software company built from the ground up from California cannabis retail and delivery since 2014. Hua has partnered with dispensaries and delivery services of all sizes throughout California, utilizing technology to maintain compliance with state and local regulations, scale with the adult use market, and create operational efficiencies that allow businesses to thrive. He's also collaborated with California's cannabis community, such as you all and regulators to draft, implement, and provide stakeholder feedback of medicinal and adult use regulations. Hua sits on the board of the CCIA and the CBA and has also served on the NCIA retail committee. What's up, Hua? And finally, this conversation will be moderated by Jennifer Gallerani, the director of compliance at Blackbird which is a software and operations company servicing each touch point in the cannabis supply chain. She joined Blackbird after 11 years of working with project delivery teams for high profile transportation infrastructure improvements, obtaining environmental clearance under state and federal law. Jennifer's knowledge of laws and regulations pertaining to cannabis compliance allows her to be particularly effective in strategizing the most efficient approach to approvals involving local state and federal agencies she leads several industry-wide initiatives directly with the BCC through her board position with CDA, particularly with issues related to track and trace systems. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, Jennifer, I hand it over to you. Let's do this. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here and um, I want to congratulate Meadow for having so many people attending on a Saturday. This is really impressive. Um, I'm excited to be on this panel because you've put together um, a completely diverse operator set here so we can get all the different perspectives of where the current supply chain challenges and opportunities lie. And I'm going to just jump right in asking everyone around the table, if we look at the last year, um, what are the key challenges with your supply chain partners and the movement of products with licenses. And I'd like to sort of extract out the world ending in the last six months. So extracting out COVID challenges, extracting out fires in California, and just thinking about what the regulatory setting was in the past year. Can you tell me what the key challenges were during that time to move product in California? 
uh, the last six months. Um, it's a little difficult for me to answer that question that clearly simply because my farm has been licensed now coming on. This is its third fully licensed state season. And so a lot of the real hard logistics um, we have kind of dealt with at my farm side. Um, and I have transitioned into the retail side a lot. I would say that's been a lot more relevant in this last six months and extracting the COVID part is um, extra difficult <laughs> because that's what's like fresh and light on my mind right now are just the like immediate challenges that I'm dealing with. But I would say like if I were to pare down the last, the first six months of 2020 or the last three of 2019 and the first three of 2020, what were the hardest logistics coming through the 2019 harvest season? Um, from a farmer's perspective at High Water Farm, I would say feeling really unsupported in getting payment through cannabis products that has gone through distribution. And so whether it be for manufacturing or whether it go to farm or, or to retail, um, it's a really difficult and really lonely road trying to um, track down those payments and track down the money and keep everything on top and make sure that it comes in in a timely way. I would say mainly just because most of my logistics around the permit process and the state regulating agencies and all of that has been mostly, hopefully mostly done with. I did have a few things come up, but mostly good. Great, and then with, let's just go ahead and tack on now the ending of the world. Would you say, um, has COVID and the fires exasperated those challenges or do you feel like there are new ones presented under um, COVID and the fires? Yeah, I mean, from the farmer from the farm perspective, my farm is uniquely situated because we're in the Eel River floodplain, flanked by old growth redwoods and a non-burning forest, and the river ocean air comes up. So our air quality has been pretty good on the farm in general, but my farm community has been really suffering. My immediate family lost property. My sister and her husband lost their home and farm and that's been really heavy and every day even this morning we're, we're negotiating getting fire equipment out to people and you know wondering should they harvest early is the fire going to come is it not going to come all of that's been really difficult um, I think every year there's this California we have fire season now and every year there's this idea that oh the fires are really going to impact the prices of the California marketplace and I don't know how much I believe that to be true. I think that there's a lot of cannabis coming into the regulated market. There's a lot of farmers that are getting their stuff together and really understanding the scale that they're working at. And a lot of the costs are understood and fixed at this point. And so I feel like while it is doom and gloom and the COVID is doom and gloom and you know the planet and climate change and all this stuff is really doom and gloom, um, from a farmer's perspective, there's always, um, reason to hope for the next thing and, and the next season and to start fresh and we'll start fresh again and we'll figure this out, you know, whether it's a new, you know, um, election, whether it's a new planting season, you know, whatever. I do anticipate that there's going to be a huge uh, impact to the market in some way from the fires, um, whether it be smoke damage and a lot more cannabis goes to manufacturing or whether the price, we do see the prices holding. Um, but I do believe that most of the prices that are holding stable kind of in the farm world where they are, are mostly just because people are understanding and knowing their costs and including them in the process down the supply chain. Great, thank you. And so how have you adjusted your operations? And one, you know, give one example of adjusting your operations to overcome some of those challenges you mentioned, discussing early harvesting. Are there other means that you've overcome some of those challenges in the last few months? Um, the fire's not really on my farm. That's not really an issue. Um, COVID has a little bit impacted the way that we are gonna take down the harvest in terms of um, using friends and family to help and, you know, making sure that people have COVID tests before they come on the farm and really super, super scaling back our crew to, you know, we plan to harvest and hang and dry and cure 20,000 square feet with uh, four people. Yeah. And then uh, moving on then to Zachary. Same question to you. So over the past year, if you were to extract out the most recent challenges with COVID and fires and just look at where you were at pre-quarter one, 
what would you say the key challenges were? And then adding in COVID and fires, exasperating those, how have you adjusted your operations to overcome that? Um, well, it's really hard to uh, kind of compartmentalize COVID as opposed to other operational challenges because I think it's permeated into every aspect of our business. Um, we're not physically moving product or selling it. We are supporting existing supply chains. So we're really at the mercy of the health of those supply chains. And Enresco operates in both the food and cannabis space. And so while some of our customers have done well and maybe have even grown during this period of time, there's other ones that, you know, they were selling into, you know, stores or, or supermarkets or elsewhere that have just completely closed. And, and so they're, their business is completely dried up and that's challenging for us being able to project, you know, how many analysts we need and, and how much instrumentation we require and so forth. Um, in addition to that, we had one COVID case at our laboratory and, and you know, it was hard even getting people to come in to work uh, after that and because they're so scared. And so, you know, our customers require a very quick turnaround time on the results if we can't depend on dependably provide that, it can be disastrous for our companies. So just having that uncertainty and, um, you know, you know that those challenges have, have been um, yeah, very difficult for us, but so far we've, we've been able to handle them okay. Yeah. I would like to say, I think that the reason why I'm asking folks to isolate out and extract COVID and fires exasperating challenges is because I'd like to talk about um, three regulatory agencies merging. And when we talk about three agencies merging, it's an opportunity to solve some of the regulatory challenges as they blend everything together and make changes. And so um, in thinking about COVID and how we respond to COVID and adjust operations to COVID and fires, we also have to think about and not forget how the regulations were operating prior to then or if they're exasperated by the problems. Um, and my next question, maybe Brian, if you want to answer this one, is thinking about your challenges and, and your key um, operations and how you've had to overcome those challenges, what are you most hoping to see in those blended regulations? Oh man, I start with metric first. Um, onboarding that service software has been a real challenge for us um, as we are inbounding products from other suppliers and manufacturers inside distribution along with Kiba. Um, trying to remain fluid and efficient has been a challenge. Um, um, tax sort of um, sophistication, whether it's cultivation, um, whether it's local taxes or retailers um, and even like local municipalities, that's been a challenge for us on how we apply taxes and pay for taxes throughout sort of the value chain of cannabis uh, and just regulations in general. It cer certainly seems like we have a lot of trade groups um, that all have different initiatives. And it'd be nice if sort of these trade groups could sort of form an alliance and lean into two to three initiatives per period or per quarter. So it's a collective front, um, knowingly that not all of the not all of what we're trying to solve for is going to help each individual trade group, but it may help move things a little bit faster than they are. Okay, and so you spoke the magic word metric for me, which is a very close and dear topic <laughs> that I've been tackling. I'm going to save that for a little later on and dive into some of the metric challenges for everyone. Uh, who uh um, in terms of retail and uh, the supply chain of delivery, what have you seen as the key challenges in the supply chain and the movement between licenses and adding on COVID? How has that exasperated things? Sure. Um, well, I think you can kind of divide up into like pre-essential, after-essential. Um, having essential designation had, was huge for us and that's been echoed a lot over the last couple of days with a lot of people. And, um, you know, I felt like everything has been just constant headwind after headwind after headwind. And I think the essential designation sort of abated a little bit of that and gave us a bit of a boost. Um, you know, I think 
So Meadow is an interesting place. You know, we, we are not retail. I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, but we serve retail and delivery operators, around 160 of them across the state. So mom and pop delivery services to some of the biggest dispensaries in the state, just to give you context on, on where this information is coming from. And the person actually actually invited uh, could not show up because he had to go to a fire emergency. So I'm kind of stepping in to fill this role here. Um, but we end up surveying a bunch of our, our uh, customers here. And I think it kind of boiled down to a few three areas. You know, one is the cost of compliance. That's been extremely tough for operators. Um, we also experienced an increase in tax at that time. I don't know if you remember, but we were at 60% before on the wholesale markup and we went to 80% and we were freaking out because we they still had more room to go. Um, there's also this push and pull on the markup price between the distributor and the retailer. You know, a retailer doesn't have the ability of writing off their 280E expenditures and cost, uh, so the, the product gets marked up a bit. Also, that was in, in a lot of ways taking advantage of the operators up in the supply chain, taking you know longer terms, not paying on time, all of those things because they were you know working on whatever they're working on um, on their cash flow because um, they just kept bleeding out on different areas for that that compliance metric being a huge piece. You know, some of these operators had to hire one, two, three, four people just to run metric. Um, you know, you guys know January 16th was finally the day where I was like mandated, you need to use this. Before that, it was like, okay, I'll just opt in and kind of do it, sort of. And it was this patchwork of non metric and metric operators. Remember that? It was like, the hey, phase. This, oh, God, <laughs> that, that, was, that sucked. Hey, man, can you send me in the doc? Actually, I'm a metric. I can't, can you? Uh, and those like all these paper manifests, double redundancy, uh, it was a mess. And then, you know, so the efficiency suffered too. So there's the cost of compliance, efficiency, which people were changing their workflows. And then I think it was really around like, how do you continue focusing on the customer, right? How do you continue to know who's coming into your door and properly stock the shelves, monitor the inventory, provide that feedback back in the supply chain. Um, you know, we think a lot about how to create more transparency within the marketplace to allow the cultivators and manufacturers, distributors, and work hand in hand. So another thing we saw is operators that were siloed um, struggled a bit. They didn't have uh, during the transition uh, to you know, COVID. Um, so kind of shifting gears, after essential designation, uh, you started seeing terms dry up, right? Distributors pull terms because product was flying. March 16th, March 17th, that entire chunk, I think all of us are just like, holy moly, it's 420. Mm -hmm. What just happened? Um, so that was another boost. And then we had a whole month of 420. Everyone was home. Finally, we were like getting the, the momentum uh, and the cash back up because you had no terms. Distributor was like, well, this is what we have. You either take it or not, or pay up on your, uh, on your overdue invoices or things like that. So people that had really good relationships kept those supply chains. And then people that had shifted their, their uh, retail operations also did well. So uh, you saw around 25% of the sales that used to be in retail, they just had a storefront, shift to online e-commerce. So if you had curbside pickup, which the BCC allowed, if you had, you know, uh, contacts to delivery or you had areas to keep safe, right? Because dispensaries on the front lines, retailers also had a whole chunk of cash that they had put out on making sure their teams were safe, on making sure the distro coming in was safe and they knew what the protocols were. Meanwhile, making sure that they're accepting metric transfer the right way Meanwhile, you know, reporting the taxes the right way, all of these things. So um, those are just some of the examples that they had to, to switch and, and move in from a pre-COVID or pre-essential to post-essential state. Definitely. And then Boris, is there anything folks haven't said so far that apply to your operations in terms of what have been the biggest challenges in this past year? 
Yeah, I would say, you know, first of all, it's awesome to see everybody in this COVID world. I haven't seen so many of you. Crystal, I think I actually drove by you in Arcadia the other day, and I was like, I think that's Crystal. Now I definitely know it was you because I, I see your hair. Um, but, uh, you know, people have touched on most things, so I don't want to belabor any points. But what I didn't really hear is, you know, we were from two sides, and we sort of throw everything through our branded products. So I don't have a lot of the direct challenges that a lot of distributors have working with multiple manufacturers. Um, but I would say I have two perspectives. I have sort of the PMB perspective um, for most of our relief line. You know, the farms, like Crystal said, they know their prices, they know their customers, relationships have been built. Uh, what I have seen from the farmer side is those that are trying to get their top flower to market um, get held up in distribution. Um, you know, up here in the Emerald Triangle, we've had many distributors either fail or not work through and farm. I mean, I was at Sunrise, they lost $50,000 in product um, this year, you know. Um, and in receipts because of that. So uh, another problem I'm seeing is just because of how regular regulations have been structured, product quality is down, right? And we're competing with all our taxes against a, a traditional market where quality may even be, I mean, I know it's tested here, but quality from the flower perspective, if you look as a, as a heady is better, right? Because it's not in a jar for seven months and we haven't all figured out jar stability. So when I look at the flower market and sourcing as it applies there, it's not something I'm in. And it's a reason why we're not in it is because guaranteeing that quality, especially with someone that's opening eight month old flower, I think is a big problem. It's one of the biggest regulatory hurdles that that farms that want to get branded flower out, out on the market are going to face. And it's what's forcing them at a lower price range to go out there and wholesale bulk flower, which is also a great business model. But um, I do see that being a, a big problem from the farmer's perspective. Uh, from the extract perspective in live resin, you know, that is also an issue, you know, because there's two harvest seasons up here. From our perspective, we're really looking at how do you manage the cash flow? How do you maintain high quality product coming in, freezing it? You know, all of that infrastructure with the new fresh frozen coming in. A lot of people are into it up here. We are as well. Um, building the infrastructure to essentially become an ice cream company uh, that, that travels across the state. Because as soon as you bring it in fresh from the half side, you have to keep it cold all the way until retail, right? So um, working with farms to understand how to do that. And there's a lot of competition up here. So I think that's definitely an opportunity for a lot of farms up here with a lot of nuance and quality control. But I feel from the farm's perspective, there is a lot of issue getting the top flower to market. That's very interesting. Um, Brian, are there any other, in the midst of all this chaos, are there any other factors or, or um, analyses that you use to determine how and when to scale? Um, or how are you making sure that you're meeting market demand in your, in your supply chain? Uh, we do a few things and created some software, both for Kiva and our supplier partners. Um, one is um, average days on hand. Um, it's not meeting demand based on past historicals. It's having enough product at the time the customer wants to buy it, that being the dispensary. And that's certainly been a challenge um, to try to meet the demand that's been taking place because of COVID. Um, the next one is just fill rate. Um, so all of our suppliers plus KSS establishes a fill rate metric that when an order is placed, we're able to fill it at least a range from 95 to 98% of the time. Um, and the final one is prioritization. So as this industry continues to innovate bring in new strains, bring in new products, the complexity of meeting demand of innovation while keeping up a base business certainly is a challenge for all of us. And how do you go to market knowingly you're going to run out at some point? You have to prioritize those products and there has to be a collective effort to do that. Now, are there any lessons learned that folks want to share about this kind of what we're talking about as the peak of being called essential and everybody buying out all the products off the shelf as fast as possible. Are there any lessons learned from that wave uh, and the after effects that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think, I think lessons learned for us was just um, uh, is having your base business protected at all time. And um, if you can foresee any challenges upstream for actives or raw materials, is that you pivot the business and support your products and portfolio um, while you wait for those to come in. Um, secondly is, um, you know, what's the role of innovation inside your organization 
and really how much business is that going to drive? How much margin is that going to provide you? Sometimes the smallest innovation, which is the greatest idea, but small in scale, finds its way disrupting everything else in the supply chain. And that doesn't make it easy for customers that are walking inside of dispensaries and looking for your product they can't find. Yeah. And how about you, Boris? I, I can definitely agree with that. You know, we, we struggle with that being in, in the position we are to, to really innovate within our core product line. Like, like Brian says, the juice is not always worth the squeeze, right? Um, and especially when you're at the point where you're trying to meet the market, there are the challenges of COVID. We haven't had too many issues with dealing with the distribution side, but we're, we're lucky we distribute ourselves. So we've done that for a while and, and we feel there's a lot of value, especially in today's world for that, because a lot of the metric problems I hear about, yes, we've had them, but because we have an integrated system from, from the time we bring in our cannabis raw material, um, from then until it reaches the dispensary shelf, it's all within our distribution system. So it's a lot easier for us. Um, so I don't have challenges there, but on the innovation side, when you're trying to meet the, pro meet the market demand and the shift to digital definitely hurt us on the retail side, but from the sourcing side, you know, we've been doing this for a few years, right? And so the, the relationships you build with farms uh, and, 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 and the ongoing, you know, supply chain there, uh, we've been able to manage that pretty well. I, I think the inventory side, as you scale, you have to make sure that you're not overbuying inventory, holding too much on your balance sheet and, you know, working through that as a working process. But when you're capturing most of the cannabinoids in oil, like we do, they have a pretty stable um, shelf life uh, in, the, in the manufacturing facility. So um, I do think that the innovation side, you know, I, is, 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 is tough, but when it comes to the cannabis sourcing, there's going to be enough cannabis to, to source for the products that we make. Yeah. And then going back to uh, metric. So everyone has their own issues with metric as uh, different types of operator types. I will say personally, and from my perspective, I've heard the most challenges coming from cultivation and then Zach recently with the release of that bulletin and having the lab testing statuses lock the movement of packages that um, may have not been tested prior to onboarding. I wanna kind of dive into metric, um, talking to both of you. Um, Crystal, you just got your license, you just onboarded. Um, was there anything that you can take away from the metric onboarding as you got your license? that surprised you? How much administrative time did it take you? What is the ongoing challenges for you as a farmer? Um, well, to be clear, I've had my farm license for multiple years at this point, and my, um, my retail license I just have had in the last six months. And I have had the honor, privilege, terrible honor of being involved in metric with both cultivation, distribution, and retail. And I will just say no one has the issues of cultivators in metric. Metric for sun-grown full season cultivators is an absolute nightmare. It is not intuitive. It does not match our processes. Nothing makes sense. And I consider myself pretty intelligent. I've been in the track and trace world since Humboldt County launched the first track and trace with SICPA. And I've kind of grown up with it, going through the system and watching it. And just last night, I drove from my retail after I closed down to the farm, spent three hours in putting the data into metric from the farm that we had pulled in that day. And um, it's a mess. It's a mess. It does, you know. And so from the retail and the distro side, it's relatively straightforward. I think I can't really speak too hard on the retail side because I just learned yesterday or the day before yesterday that I needed to go in and remove all the zeros. <laughs> so there are some things that um, I'm still learning, but my POS software makes it super easy. Everything with metric, just not being a micro business here, I'm just a retail license. Everything comes in through distribution. It's metric. I, you know, unless they made a mistake on their manifest, which they often do, um, everything's pretty seamless in the retail side on metric. I, I like to say metric comes to me at retail to die, and um, and that's good. <laughs> I'm done with metric, but. Um, we have so there's so many things every single year that come up from the cultivator side that just do not make sense and i cannot understand how this platform has been used 
in cultivation in other regions and these issues have not been worked out yet. You know, I mean, there's, there, there's not a clone button. Making seeds, you register waste. There's just so many things that are nonsensical that I feel like anyone, pick any one farmer and sit down with them and have them explain how to efficiently track and trace on our farm and it would be easier, more efficient and better for everyone, you know? Right. And I would say um, across the board that that has been a commonplace thing is that there are so many nonsensical processes and metrics that don't match the real world mm -hmm. um, for every operator. Mm -hmm. For the farmers and, and any groups that you're involved with, trade associations or not, you mentioned the opportunity to sit down with a farmer and talk about the metric issues. Has there been any facilitated discussion or organization with um, CDFA and the farmers to start really listing out the metric issues and your top um, challenges with the system and how it doesn't match? Um, through ICFA, so I'll clarify a little bit of my bio. Um, I'm no longer on the main board of ICFA, which is the International Cannabis Farmers Association. A few years ago, we split into a C3 and a C4, and I serve as the chair of the C4, which is actually the Traditional Farmers Action Alliance. And so we do more of the like um, legislative and lobbyist activity that would ha be happening at the Capitol. And with COVID, we're on a major break with that. For the most part, you know, we just had the big win with SB67 and some stuff along that line. But um, through ICFA's work, I mean, we, we hone in very specifically on sun-grown cultivation. And so our public comments are consistently and repeatedly filled with information, both to CDFA about how to clarify and how to streamline and how metric creates this overburdensome process. It inter, you know, interrupts every efficiency that we have on the farm. It is does not match California's goals on waste and you know all of these other processes that you know that happen and it kind of always comes back to well it's in statute you know it's this regular you know this is what we this is how we've interpreted it this is where we're at and um you know i i do think that there's a willingness to um to see how we could modify it or make it fit or make it work from the regulating bodies but i feel like there's um not the creativity or the desire to make it work. And um, I think that the cultivators in particular are the least organized and the least advocated for just because they're so underfunded, typically like the small you know, regional farmers that we have and they don't understand government. They haven't really been in that role in that heavy way before. And so um, the trade associations kind of all end up being multi-representative of so many different things that it's hard for them to hone in really clearly on these very specific issues that cultivators have. Um, I do think, I mean, and then COVID, we have to admit and accept that COVID has really affected our ability to create change. I mean, most of the things, the state's like, we don't have time to deal with this. We don't have public comment. We don't have, you know, there's all these things that are just um, not really functioning well at the government level because of COVID and the season just came and went. And so here we are now where, you know, I have some plants that hermaphrodited from the inside that I didn't recognize or notice. And now I have these seeded plants from top to bottom that I'm working on how do I now later tag this plant that has seeds that aren't really functional seeds, but it's just, it's nightmarish, you know, and, um, and it's not efficient. And it's a really big burden for the farmers. And right now we haven't seen a lot of enforcement on it, but I feel like um, this next step in the process, we're gonna be in a really um, terrible position with the cultivators if they don't get some sort of relief or support on simplifying that process for them so that they can just put the, you know, the, the material in and, and extract what they've got. You know? yeah. And then testing, you know, I work with Enresco too and some other labs and um, the smaller farmers are way overburdened by the testing um, situation. And if you happen to grow from seed, the testing is a huge block and a huge block to market for yourself and your products. And, um, and the metric and the testing together can create some of the biggest um, problems that we have as farmers. And then the other person who was speaking earlier, maybe it was Boris about the, um, 
farmers need to like offload everything at wholesale early in the season. And that's because all these costs are up front for us. All the harvest costs, all the testing costs, all the R&D costs, all the processing costs, all the metric integration, like everything that we're doing happens in the fall, which is also the lowest price in the market. And so between security, between the plan safety power shortages and frozen material and all of these things, um, that November, December window is really brutal on farmers. And if they are given an opportunity to um, push forward and wait for that magic date in March that we know happens, um, it can be better. But metric and testing makes that super complicated. Yeah. Do you see the opportunity? Um, I know everyone is, like you said, we're all running around crazy with little time, little, little, um, affordability of anything extra, but do you see farmers um, willing to perhaps host regulators and bring them out and tour farms and, and show them why metric doesn't work? Absolutely. Um, or is there sort of a wall between the farmers and the regular where is that? Type no, I mean, we've already had the worst regulating agencies on our farms at this point, you know, Fish and Wildlife and the Water Board and, um, you know, these kind of known enemies have come to your farm and, you know, put you through the ringer. If there's someone, the state regulation body that you feel like is going to hear you or help you, um, I think most farmers are open to that conversation with guidance and support, of course. I've had uh, CDFA's Cal Organics program on the farm. I've had... Um, some people from the BCC on the farm. I open my farm to regulators all the time so that they can look at um, what a real small scale sun grown farm looks like in Humboldt County and kind of show them. And I had this kind of defining moment with a woman from the Cal Organics program where she, we were looking through, you know, these eight different phenotypes of this seed varietal that I had. And I had mentioned to her that this was all gonna have to go to extraction and why, well, why was the reason? Because I couldn't, they were so wildly phenotypically different. I couldn't put them in one bag and sell them as a product and get them tested and get it to market. And so each one of these would have theoretically had to be tested and some of the plants weren't even a pound. So even at the cheapest, you know, 650, $800 compliance test, even the cannabis wasn't worth the test. And, you know, I've been really pushing for um, one of the benefits of the Cal Organic program being that if you get certified organic on your farm, that potentially the testing regulations that are imposed upon you could be different. You know, that maybe there's a spot test for a compliance test and everything else could just be, you know, um, strain dependent. And we could get these small batch, smaller units out to market in an affordable and efficient manner. And I think that using the Cal Organic program would be a great vehicle to do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, Zach, talking about testing and how it relates um, to your supply chain, what are the challenges that you've seen with metric and are there administrative costs that you've seen for the laboratories on your end or um, more, is it more of an educational um, effort and the time put into that? How has how's metric onboarding affected your operations? Yeah, well, the, the biggest initial issue, and by, I'm not by no means the metric guy at our company, but the biggest issue is that we didn't provide, we weren't provided any guidance on how to operate metric from a lab perspective until the end of March. So we're kind of learning as we went. And, and in terms of costs, you know, we have a direct integration between our LIMS, which is our laboratory information and management software and metric. So we can upload data and we don't have to manually input, you know, 100 data points for each analysis that we perform or each sample that we test. Um, and that's really necessary, but it's also a cost because it, it's a, a custom development that our, our, our software developers had to implement and we were getting very little support from metric on, on how to do that. So there was definitely learnings that occurred along the way. Um, and then in our day-to-day -day use of metric, I'd say the biggest issue that we have is the fact that there seems to be a disconnect between metric and the BCC. So, you know, we, there's a lot of redundancy in the work that we perform. We upload the data points into metric, then we have to manually log into metric and upload the COA there. Then we have to release the tests and then we have to go email the BCC separately with the same COA. Um, so it wastes a lot of time on our end, and God forbid there's some kind of issue on the COA it needs to be amended, or there's some other technical issue. We have to get approval from the BCC before we can then go to the metric, 
support team and ask them to help us out. And then the metric team, rather than just seeing the email thread and implementing the change, then they have to connect to the BCC and back, you know, privately to make sure that they're on board with the change. And I don't know why they can't all be on the same thread together, but, um, you know, people need their results released because, you know, the difference between a two day turnaround and three day turnaround is, is huge for some people. So if their product is held up for one or two weeks because metric and BCC don't know how to talk to each other, um, that, that's a huge problem for our, our customers. And, and some of them are understanding that's not, you know, our fault necessarily. Um, but you know, other times they're not quite as understanding. So that, that proves difficult for us. Definitely. And I have firsthand experience as a distributor tag teaming with the lab and trying to get responses from metric and BCC. And on one day being told by BCC, I'm not allowed to ask permission to fix the problem. The lab has to ask. And then the next day being told, well, the distributor has to re-ask the question again. So it's just, yeah, it's a round robin. It's crazy um, back and forth. How have your, how has your operations um, handled metric training specifically since there is not really a lab focused training for metric nor is there distributor focused training on metric at this time? Yeah, I, I can't say I'm, I'm directly involved in the training that, that's occurred at the laboratory, but essentially we assign one person to really get to know metric and, you know, all aspects of having to being able to receive uh, samples and packages and being able to re release results. And then that person has gone and, and trained probably four or five other people. So we have redundancy in case someone's sick or, at, or unav unavailable. Um, and then beyond that, you know, our, our developers have, uh, you know, they know how to con contact the metric support team if there's any technical issues. So they, they handle that and we, we kind of divorce ourselves from that portion of, of the conversation. So, you know, it, it's, it's definitely not as uh, organized as we would like it to be, but that's just kind of um, what, how we were forced to operate. Yeah. Ryan, as you mentioned metric right up front. Is there anything you'd like to add from your perspective on the metric challenges and how much time and cost it has accrued over the past year for onboarding? It's the most costly part of our business because it requires um, people to manage metric inside our organization. Um, it's not automated. Our ERP system and metric don't communicate well. When we believe we've made some progress, we find it's either manual entry or a couple of zeros were emitted, like Crystal mentioned earlier. Um, and for us, trying uh, not every system, who is probably an expert in this, but expecting each ERP to take the metric ID that was established at cultivation and bring it all the way through to retailers just isn't an option. So we are recreating the exact same item in each of our systems all the way through. And it's just a ton of work. And it's a ton of work because inside our system for us is uh, our product creation doesn't follow the same guidelines as metric does. So we basically have two teams double working every aspect of the business for every product that comes in, not to mention the different um, lot sizes that each have their own metric ID. So it's a real pain and we're trying to automate it. You know, our ERP that we use is putting a team together to help us automate it, but you know, we still have a long ways to go. Yeah. I don't know if who are you want to touch on the software side and how that integrates with metric and the challenges there. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's interesting. So COVID's been good to us as an ancillary software company. Um, and because January 16th with the mandated metric piece, um, we actually did about like 30 different workshops up and down the state and you know virtual to help train people in advance of metric because we knew it was just going to be a shit show. Um, so things that we're seeing from switchovers inventory accuracy is probably the number one issue. So what we're seeing is people are doing edits within metric or doing edits within point of sale and then manually uploading or downloading reports to sync them up. And there's also been issues with metrics reliability. And during some specific downtimes, if things aren't done right, some things may go through, some things that don't. 
So we often can go into a, a retail shop, switch them over and say, hey, we can't switch you over until you actually fix your metric. Here's how to do that. You have all these packages that haven't been finished. You have all of the you have negative inventory above your 3% variance rate that you're allowed on a wholesale monthly basis because you didn't bring in the right packages because your sample package is actually at the retail or wholesale price and you didn't separate that out. So all of these little nuances really screwed uh, some of these operators that <clears throat> didn't uh, understand the, the, the complexities there. So inventory is probably number one. Um, the, the second piece is really, you know, I, I think for a retailer, at least this omni-channel sales philosophy now, right? It's no longer just the retailer um, in front of a customer. It is everything. They need to have accurate inventory on these different live menus that they have on the respective menu. They need to be able to communicate all this information accurately. So the distributors that they work with, there's a huge relationship there on like the reception of the inventory. Some systems weren't accepting the inventory, distributors weren't able to get off their system. So if they don't operate these things, they can't get it to market. And um, so we've seen a lot of inefficiency there. And then you know, probably one more thing that I've been trying to really wrap my mind around is like, why is compassion so unnecessarily hard? It, we have compassion now. But everyone's like, how do I do it? And how do you create it within metric? And how do you give it to another? Do you have to do a transfer? Like it's, uh, it's probably one of my big areas I'm trying to focus on, um, you know, this quarter and going to next, really trying to figure that out. But yeah. yeah um, the technical yeah. challenge and actually yeah. being able to track and trace the compassion. Yeah. And, you know, as a consumer... Uh, this is the last point on this consumer, just like fresh flowers, like freshness. Uh, and that goes back to the supply chain and the testing and all that stuff that we talked about. Yeah. And then looking at, looking at the compassion program or lack thereof, semi, semi program, um, how are folks making sure that compassion products are getting back and getting getting part of that essential piece of the cannabis um, supply chain, making sure that the, the compassion piece survives. Um, Boris, is there something, is there anything that you're working on making sure that the compassion programs survive in your supply chains? Look, it is a tough one. It's funny because every time we reach out to dispensaries um, and our dispensary partners, everyone's excited to do it. But then when it comes down to specifics, nobody knows what to do. And we're like, let me just drop off some product. I mean, how, why can't that just be a thing? So um, in terms of retail partners, we found, you know, a, a handful that we now do have programs that we just drop off some cases that are free and they have their own program of how they're bringing in compassion cases. <clears throat> and we work with them. Otherwise, we donate to Weed for Warriors. Anytime we have product that we can donate to them, we figure out a way. Look, there is a there is an R and D function in metric, and we basically just account for it. And we look in there, and we we make sure it doesn't. It's not diversion. We have full accountability of where it's going, and we feel that if we're going to get our license shut, a lot of people are very risk averse in this industry. For us, if it's compassion, this is where we came from. This is why we started in 2015 and going into 2016. You know, we wanted to be part of the, the 215, 420 world. We always had a compassion program where we gave out so much free product and then it just stopped. So now we found a few cases and especially Weed for Warriors is a few other ones that we've decided to, to really help with. Now we're part of an oncology group as well. We find our own ways to make sure that we can get them product, right? It's um, on the tincture side, it helps a little bit that we also have farms in Oregon and Vermont that we work with to process a, a CBD based tincture for the national market. So that has definitely opened it up and, and the topicals as well. But anybody that's worked with cannabis for a long time knows you need that THC as well. And our THC based products are definitely better than our CBD based products. Um, so getting those to people in California, we just find the right groups to work with. We, we account for in the right way and we stand by that and then we just provide it. So we don't have a de detailed program, but I can say we, we give out tens of thousands of dollars of free product um, whenever we can. That's great. Um, we've had success with um, some labs testing product where the COA has gone past the 12 months. Um, 
and maybe the manufacturer no longer wants that product that we've been storing. Um, Zach, is, is your lab doing any reduced cost lab testing for product that is still great, still usable, it just needs to be retested in order to be sold to compassion programs? Um, are you working on any initiatives like that in, internally? Yeah, I'd say we don't have any ongoing initiatives, but when people do come to us, uh, we have provided actually free testing on Compassion uh, products in the past, and perhaps we just need to publicize the fact that we're willing to, to do that. So I think we were working with Sweet Leaf Collective on some product that they were planning on donating. And so we, we're very open to, to supporting Compassion, um, and perhaps we just need more people that are willing to, that, that know that we're, we're open to that and, and willing to work with them on it. Yeah, absolutely. Get that word out there. For sure. Um, Crystal, are there compassion programs in the in the farmers and in the retail side that you're familiar with on your end that you're working with? Oops, I think you're on mute. There we go. Um, yeah, so I mean, farmers are the reason why there is still compassion. Farmers are still doing it and have been doing it and they're finding a way through their R&D, through their waste, through you know some way. <laughs> um, uh, compassion is at the kind of four, you know, it's a foundation as Bo Boris said for farmers in particular. So um, it would be awesome if the regulations can make it easier and it is, we have compassion now. So it's coming through the system. Testing has been really difficult when we've had a bulk amount of cannabis that needs to get to, um, to the retailers or to the distribution or to the manufacturers for compassion, um, the testing cost is in immediately the burden. And then, so the next thing like working with Joe and some others, even through Sean and Weed for Warriors and those guys, they all just wanted tested product already, packaged and tested product already. From the retail side, um, the reason why the compassion programs have proven more difficult, I was really involved in a lot of compassion programs through the 215 era, through all of the early 2000s. And it used to be really easy, really huge. It was really a foundation of most of the retail dispensaries in the Bay Area and the East Bay in particular. Um, and But from the retail perspective, the reason why it's harder here is A, just getting that distributed pro tested product brought here for, you know, for compassion. <laughs> the track and trace component of it and the logistics of it, and then building out the compassion program that makes sense to the consumer. So when you just have something like say, Boris dropped some stuff off here and we have a little bit, well, that person comes back and they, that's what they need. And now I don't have more of that sample, but that's what's been helping them. So now I need to either purchase it and give it to them or you know find it. So I think from the retail side, the compassion program that I've been working on here, it's really kind of a logistical nightmare to make it clear and transparent and easy for the um, people who need it most to have access. And a lot of times that's like gonna be your Rick Simpson oils, your full extract oils, topicals, tinctures, and just flour in general. And pre-rolls, I mean, pre-rolls are a great way to just get cannabis in the hands of people who need it, you know? And so um, it's been, it's been, it's, it's, I'm six months in still and the compassion program isn't clear. I've worked with three or four different friends in the industry that have been like, okay, you have one, yay, I'm gonna take yours. Or Joe, okay, bring me yours. But the whole lighter thing for weed, I, I couldn't really understand it. There's th certain things that just aren't really working yet, but um, really wanting to make the compassion program benefit the end consumer and not make people feel like they're being tricked into purchasing a product down the line or that they're not getting the compassion that they need has been my difficult part, but it's on its path. It is, you know, I, we get so many samples and so much stuff from people that I do reserve a lot of those samples for compassion, people who need it. That's great. And then Brian, are there any other compassion programs that you're working with right now that you want to give a shout out to? We extend our compassion along through um, all of our partners and all of our partners have their own unique retailers that they ship product to. So we're happy to provide those in their behalf. Um, Kiva works um, locally in Oakland with different um, compassion, uh, compassion outreach programs, uh, but it's pretty fluid to us. Um, we wanna make sure that we're filling um, their demand and also helping them um, just share out some of our product for them so they can use it for all their compassion needs. Okay. Yeah, and then from, from our side, we have um, Sweet Leaf Joe. Uh, so we, we power their, you know, we basically power the HIPAA compliant documentation 
for for them as well as um, Operation Evac. And you know we're working on. Uh, there's actually a panel coming up this weekend with uh, uh, Sarah from Pothcaring as well to to talk about compassion and how to do it. So you know I think all of us have just been so heads down with COVID. Um, when compassion did pass, now it's like okay, we, this is still really, really, really important to all of us um, that we're going to be spending more time on it. I'd love to sync up with everyone on making this a, a standard easy, no brainer thing to do um, and just remove all the friction out of it. Absolutely. So we're at the noon mark. I'm not sure if we're ready to move to the next panel or we want to do one more. Maybe we'll just do one closeout for everybody and then we'll shoot to the next panel. All right. Um, we have in California, we have the CAC, uh, Cannabis Advisory Committee meetings happening. We've discussed a lot of challenges um, and a lot of issues that we're trying to overcome. If there was one unified message and one challenge that you think all operator types could get behind and provide one message to the CAC, which topic would that be? And which initiative would that be to correct the regulations at this time? And I'll just start from Crystal. Um, I would just say here in this conversation, that metric doesn't work for the California marketplace in the way that it's written now. Great. And Zach? Well, I guess if we're looking for a unified message, then I think the, the commonality that we all share is our, our, uh, our issues with metrics. <laughs> that seems to be the low hanging fruit. Um, yes, yeah, so let, let's just go with that. Metric, okay. Brian? Access. There just isn't enough access for people to purchase cannabis in a state this size, and the bottleneck of approving licenses needs to improve. And then Boris. Uh, guys, I'm a broken record on this if you've ever talked to me, but taxes. We are overtaxed in this industry, and as long as we are 40 or 50 percent more expensive than the traditional market, we will not gain those customers, and we will be a horrible failure of a model it doesn't work it just from cultivation tax to how it's booked to excise tax to half the dispensaries not even applying it correctly i'm i taxes are the number one issue in the california regulated market and david what would be your yeah for me it's you know everyone's been great about it, all the points uh, equity it, it's top of mind on so many fronts I think you know we're witnessing decades in the war on drugs that have happened and the, the collateral damage that's there. But now we have this first time in history a program being staged up to help you know push the needle back in the right direction. And the world's watching. And I think that it's not just in cannabis, it's other industries. So I think there's this thing that we've written into law that uh, really can affect change in communities and create generational wealth. But, you know, we know it's so tough. The best of the best struggle. So it's a tall order to come together to create a, a level playing field, but also not just a lottery ticket, but people can like really, really, really thrive. Um, yeah, so that, that's top of mind for us. That's great. And I, I did appreciate the panel, I believe it was yesterday um, or the day before with the different trade associations talking about how all of the trade associations can come together on these topics. I think all of them that everyone just mentioned are honestly equally important. And I'm hoping that through this collaboration, through our conversations that we can all start to agree with one another that we all have very similar goals here and we all need to start speaking the same language to the regulators in order to make the change happen. <laughs>